Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast. I'm Josh, and I'm here today with Mustafa Al-Bassam, who is the co-founder of Celestia, which is a project that purports to uh, help with the creation of modular blockchains. So we'll go into that. It's a little bit technical, but we'll explain it in a way, even though you may not understand what that means. And he's also an ex-member of the hacking group Lulsec, which if you were paying attention back, I think it was in, the, in 2011 for the most part, some of the hacks that were happening during that time that were associated with as well whenever Anonymous was, was more in the mainstream media. But so before we get into that, I wanted to ask uh, Mustafa, or actually like share with Mustafa that I didn't realize that you were kind of one of the, the, the I guess, co-founders of Lulsec or one of the hackers of Lulsec until I read the book Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy by Gabriella Coleman, which is a really nice book, um, which I highly recommend to people if you have the chance to read it. And when I read your name in the book, I was like, I, this name is so familiar. Like, I, re- I feel like I've read this name before. And then I went on Twitter, like, while I was, like, in the middle of reading the book. And I was like, oh, my gosh, he has the same name. Is that him? And I started Googling, like, is this the right same person? And I realized it was the same person. So, yeah, so I'm really, like, honored to have you on to, to talk about your experience with Lulsec. And then it was, like, really a surprise to me. Like, like a nice surprise to me to hear that you are now in the, in the crypto world. So going to be really interesting to talk about how that transition happens. But yeah, welcome, Mustafa. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. And I've also been following your stuff on Twitter quite a bit. Uh, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed my, my spicy tweets. But yeah, <laughs> I was wondering maybe to start off, for people who maybe aren't aware, could you explain a bit? Before we get into Celestia, let's start with Lulsec, since that happened uh, before in the past. What was Lulsec? And kind of what was the, you know, the conditions during that time for maybe the people who don't remember? Sure. So LulzSec, where the lulz in LulzSec stands for LOL, kind of like a corruption of the word LOL. But it was a hacker group that I co-founded in 2011 that existed for a few months. And it hacked into all, all sorts of governments and organizations. So for example, we hacked into Sony seven times. We hacked into like various governmental entities, like FBI affiliates. We hacked into the Arizona Police Department. And we did denial of services hacks that took the websites of people like the CIA offline. But Lulzsec was started as a sort of offshoot to another group that I was part of called Anonymous. And I kind of became involved with Anonymous around, you know, 2010. And I kind of got involved in into it in response to various activities regarding like freedom of speech and freedom of information. So for example, when PayPal and MasterCard and Visa blocked donations to WikiLeaks, Anonymous did a denial of service attack that took MasterCard and Visa offline. And then, so I kind of like got involved and I realized that, you know, information or hacktivism could be a powerful tool because at the time, this idea of a denial of service attack it was something that everyone could participate in. So like if you wanted to help take the website of Visa or MasterCard offline, you could anyone could just download a piece of software and join this chat room and they could coordinate and they could turn their computer into a sort of device that that floods the websites of PayPal or MasterCard. And so everyone could sort of join it. And, and to me, this was a really interesting idea because it was sort of like a virtual version of a physical sit-in. So sort of like how back in the you know in the, in the twentieth century people had were sitting in as a form of protest mm. you know, in the restaurants they were ddosing restaurants back then exactly <laughs> yeah and this was like kind of like a digital version of that and to me it was really interesting but I kind of wanted to go further than that because to me like that only gets you so far right mm-hmm. you can take the website offline but but it will be back online it will get better and uh, ddos mitigation mm-hmm. and all it really achieves is some attention. And uh, to the cause, and that's kind of good in a way, but it doesn't really achieve much more than that. Mm-hmm. So I kind of wanted to figure out, like, well, what, what, what if we actually do more than that? What if we actually like hack into these organizations and reveal information, hack, you know, emails mm. um, or wrongdoing and that kind of thing? I, I thought that would be, more. and so I kind of like found the people in these chat rooms that I thought were had more technical skills than other people, and I created a smaller chat room. A more private chat room that was just for hacking. Mm. 
And then we kind of said, well, let's try to hack into these different organizations. Let's see what we can find. Like one of the earliest ones we did was this, you know, this, this U.S. military or defense contractor called HB Gary Federal. <laughs> and we leaked emails from them and it was revealed that they were trying to do all kinds, all kinds of things like working with Palantir to blackmail American journalists yeah. like Glenn Greenwald, who, were, who supported WikiLeaks, for example. And, you know, when we leaked those emails, the press started looking into them and they and and Congress wanted to do an investigation into HB Gary Federal and the, and the CEO resigned. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was really interesting because it kind of made me realize that information can actually be quite powerful. It can it can kind of like level the playing field, right? Because at the time, I was just fifteen or sixteen years old, and you know, I was just in my bedroom. I had a, I had a laptop, but I was able but I was able to participate in activities that could make a CEO resign or make Congress launch, launch an investigation. <laughs> That's a lot of power so, for a 15, 16 year old to have <laughs> and to feel, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's a very, it's an asymmetric form of, form of warfare in a way, mm -hmm. because it makes, made you realize that someone with very little resources can potentially level the playing field with someone with much more resources by mm -hmm. using information. And yeah. That, yeah, to me, that was really interesting. And then, but at the time, yeah, at the time Anonymous was doing, in our group, we were doing like a lot of like hacktivist things. The, the hacks we were doing was, was mostly related to activism related things. So for example, like we participated in Arab Spring and we took down, we hacked the website of the prime minister of Tunisia, for example, or we would help, you know, people in Egypt and other Arab countries figure out how to prevent government surveillance and mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of thing. We also hacked into the Westboro Baptist Church, for example. Yeah. So it was mostly like activist related hacks. But then at some point, people started kind of like coming up with a lot of finding a lot of vulnerabilities in corporations that we didn't really have. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have a hacktivist reason to hack. Like, so for example, like one day someone found a vulnerability in Fox and mm -hmm. they found they got access to the uh, database of X Factor contestants. And that wasn't, that's not really activist. There's no, like, there's no good reason to hack that from an activist perspective. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I started LulzSec because I didn't want that stuff to be kind of hacked under the banner of anonymous. Because to me, anonymous should be like for ha activism. Mm -hmm. So LulzSec was created as, as kind of like an alternative outlet. Well, if you have all these hacks, but you just want to do it for fun, do it under that, do, do it under LulzSec. Right, for the lulz. And eventually, LulzSec kind of grew into a kind of thing of its own and became like even bigger because back in 2011, the internet was much less secure. Like there were so many basic vulnerabilities everywhere. And so mm -hmm. like you had, for example, like the fact that we hacked 77 times, like a lot of these corporations just did not care about security. Mm -hmm. So the only way to make, would, to make them care was actually to kind of like leak their information because otherwise it was kind of like the emperor with no clothes. Right. Like no one wanted to say that they had no clothes. Until we kind of showed up and said, "Well, we're just going to leak all your stuff because you're not you're not paying attention." So, for example, like when we hacked the when 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 the Arizona Police Department was hacked, which was done by uh, Jeremy Hammond, which was someone who spent ten years in jail. He the the, the password of the officer was one two three four five six, and that's where they were hacked. So it, people just weren't taking security seriously at, at that time. Yeah, one of the one of the things I've kind of heard, like in hacker culture, I think that I learned a lot probably in Gabriella Coleman's book was that, um, and like a lot of the stories that you've that you shared with, uh, she writes about in the book, but there's kind of like also this ethic of, for some of for some hackers, if something is easy to hack, then it should be almost like if you don't care about security, then you deserve the hacking, not even necessarily because you did something wrong, but because <laughs> like. You're bad at security, and therefore you deserve it. Yeah, I mean, quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's too. Th that's also true to some extent, but it was also the case mm -hmm. that Zaltek, like the whole point of it was to do some, was like to have fun, or to mm -hmm. hack what's funny. But it also turns out like what, what is funny to hack is also what's just to hack, mm -hmm. like, like because justice is funny. Like it's more funny to hack a big corporation mm -hmm. that deserves it than to hack a hospital, for example. Right. Right. And that's all. That's also the case. And so even Lulzsec turned out to be somewhat political. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it tried not to be, but ended up being anyways. Yeah, yeah but yeah, I mean, exactly. as well, maybe to like to to 
summarize the story for a lot of people since we have other things to, to talk about as well. And you can find, I know you've done interviews at other places as well. We've gone into more detail, but you were very young, 15, 16, uh, I believe it was. So, and you were, I mean, these were, you know, purportedly, these were crimes that were committed. And so, I mean, it is kind of, honestly, just kind of badass that like, you did it at such a young age. And so you didn't have to deal with, if you were, I think, over 18, then it would have been a lot more serious of, of, of a crime than, than it actually, actually ended up being for you. Yeah, because I was the only person in the UK case. So it turns out like four of the hackers, and this was a complete surprise, but like four of the hackers that we were working in the group were, were from the UK. And there were only six or seven mm -hmm. hackers in the group, and we had no idea where we were, but they all were in the UK. And yeah, because I was, I was the only person under 18, so I had a non-custodial sentence where I had to basically spend around 300 hours doing community service in a charity shop that sold clothes for like deaf and blind people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like I think a lot of other hackers, uh, especially ones that were uh, mentioned in the book, got some pretty big, big sentences. I mean, in the US, it's a lot more harsh. As mm -hmm. I said, one of our co-defendants or co-conspirators, Jeremy Hammond, he spent 10 years in jail, you know, all the way yeah. from 2013 to something like 2023, which was very kind of harsh. In the UK, it was a lot more lenient. Like no one spent more than a few months in jail. I do think it's getting a bit more strict. So for example, a few years ago, there was one other hacker called Kane Gamble who hacked the director of the CIA mm. and he kind of like put up a message when he hacked his elite emails or documents. And the message he put with that was something like, well, if you don't stop like aiding the illegal occupation in Palestine, then I want to keep hacking you. And mm. what happened to him was what happened to Kane. He was also 16 years old in the UK and he was also kind of convicted on computer hacking, but he had a jail sentence. And that was the first time anyone under 18 had a jail sentence for hacking in the UK. And the judge in that case called him, he used language like cyber terrorism, for that, wow. which I think is really harsh. Like if you're just under, if you're just like a teenager doing hacking basically for fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something that now the legal system is taking much more over time. Like need, it's taking more seriously as more and more companies complain about it as they see like the, I don't know, they don't like to be embarrassed in that way. And I guess if you use the example of like a restaurant where you can sit into sitting in a restaurant will only last for so long. People have to leave every once in a while, like a DDoS attack. But if you're taking information, if you're taking, you know, I don't know, food from the kitchen and taking it out is maybe like the metaphor that they're using. But of course, there's like a difference between between data and like material commodities. I'm wondering how because that in like this experience is really interesting to me because now you're in the blockchain world, crypto world, which is this place where information is completely free, where it is publicly available on a distributed ledger and everybody can kind of take from it, at least for, for public blockchains. But yeah, I wonder, was that experience, and maybe as well, I know during that time you mentioned that Bitcoin was being used by hackers, but was, like, was there something in particular in that experience that made you see blockchains as like a something to then pursue after once you were able to use computers again after your sentencing um but yeah i was, I was wondering if you had yeah. any thoughts on that yeah i think there's definitely a lot of parallels so the same way that i as a teenager with the you know a 500 dollars laptop could level the playing field by hacking corporations with very little knowledge i see um cryptocurrency as very similar in, sen in the sense that it's technology it's relatively but relatively simple to some extent technology that also levels the playing curve between individuals and powerful actors. It's basically a continuation of the idea that information and technology can liberate people and can level the playing for playing field, even if you don't have a lot of resources. Do you do you wonder though about like sometimes with technology and the issue of like power relations that. I think people a lot of the times have this idea or have this fear that in the future, that's going to be a very almost like zero or one, if I could describe it that way, that like either there there is a way to level the playing field or there completely is not. And that's kind of like the dystopian 
cyberpunk future that we're heading towards that almost like there needs to be vulnerabilities in corporate databases for there to be a chance to 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 be like some sort of outlets for people in in a more digitized world yeah i mean that's very interesting because in some way you could argue that the internet has made it a lot easier for governments to surveil people you yeah. know because now like we're, we're basically in like in the golden age of surveillance yeah. And so, as I said, like information is an asymmetric form of warfare, but I guess that kind of applies both ways mm-hmm. because like governments or governments can also surveil people, but then, you know, you have encrypted messaging apps, for example. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think the answer to kind of like a like government or corporations oppre- oppressing people is more liberatory technologies, not less techn- liberatory technologies. Now, because it is the case that technology, technologies that liberate people can be used against people. So for example, mm-hmm. like the internet can, can be used to, to liberate people, but, it can, but it's also being used against people, you know, by using, by using it as a means of mass surveillance. You know, same with cryptocurrencies. It can also, you know, you have dictators wanting to also create their own cryptocurrencies. You know, you have, mm-hmm. you have centrally banked, the idea of the centrally banked digital currencies. So, you know, it does kind of extend to this idea where information is, I mean, technology is neutral to some extent. But I think, I guess my thinking is that it's a kind of cat and mouse game, but I think you can always get ahead of the kind of like game with more technology, with technologies, with even more technology that liberates people. So for example, you can say, okay, the internet, mass surveillance, but then you can, you have, sig- you have technologies like Signal, for example, that, pre- that mm-hmm. prevents that. And there is no kind of like, there is in theory that there is no theoretical technological way to defeat encryption, right? The only way you can defeat that is in the real space by regulations that physically prevent people from using those applications. But even then, how how can we tell? How, it's very di- even then you can kind of fight against that by making it very difficult to tell if you have those applications. So I think inherently, pe- technologies that liberate people always kind of favor. In theory, if you kind of like play it out to the kind of like end game, it will always I think favor the people, the individual, the, the the people that need to be liberated. And not the oppressors. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I feel that like kind of the big the question that has to be answered on, on whether or not a particular technology is liberatory in part has to be answered like who owns that technology? Who is like you know who who owns that means of of technological production? And I think it is often the case that it is like giant capitalist corporations or whatever else and that's part of the reason why technology becomes oppressive is because we've allowed them to completely own that and what i think blockchains bring an interesting proposal to people to kind of to allow for a more in the case where the state is not like doing its job it's it's end of the of the of the bargain or the social contract in governing in you know in the interests of the people Blockchains being a kind of proposal, well, hey, how do we, how can we potentially put technology in the hands of people in a way that is digitally native so that we don't necessarily need the intervention of a state that may or may not like change how it works anytime soon? Um, yeah. Yeah. To me, the, uh, the fundamental thing that blockchains enable that, you know, haven't been, haven't been possible before. It's like, for example, like if you take the idea that, you know, Bitcoin um, is the first, is arguably the first practical implementation of like a kind of like crypto anarchic system, right? You could argue whether it's like anarcho capitalist mm-hmm. or, or, or not, but it's the first implementation of like a practical crypto anarchic system like that kind of like works. And the implications of that is that it kind of fundamentally enables, the, the new thing that fundamentally enables is something that I call a top level social contract. So like for mm. throughout history, human beings have had social contracts with each other. And for example, like economic social contracts, you know, you do this, I do that. If you do that, I, I agree to do that. Or I could, for example, if I do that, I agree to pay you, right? And uh, historically to enforce those social contracts among people, you typically needed to you know, have a, like a physical court system, you know, physical police to enforce that and so on and so forth. And so, like, if you wanted to create a company or a corporation or organization, you would typically have to do that in a way that kind of like is within the inherits the inherits kind of like is, is under the structure of a company law or corporate law. 
And what does what 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 gives corporate law its authority is the parliament of a country or or the congress or the government of a country. And what 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 gives the country what gives a country's government or congress or parliament authority is basically a social contract among the people in that country. Like if if the people in that country wanted to do a revolution, they could throw away the authority of a government in theory if it, if it, if it really came to that. But what blockchains fundamentally enable fundamentally is to shortcut all that and to have a social contract that is top level in the sense that it does not inherit any authority, does not rely on the authority of governments or kind of like a, con- a congress or a, a parliament, but allows you to have like literally a social contract on a blockchain underneath it, underneath that. So that's what I call a kind of like a, it, for the first time in history, it, 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 it enables what I call a top level social contract. Like there is no social contract above that because historically, if you wanted to start a company, there is always there's always some other social contract on top of that, like that, like a government, for example. No. But with a blockchain, you, for the first time, you can create an agreement among people that is top level in the sense like there is nothing above that. There is no other authority above, like there's no there's no authority above Bitcoin. Like it's governed directly by the social consensus of Bitcoin. That's mm. that's something fundamentally new that I think people don't think about. And it, it, it creates a very powerful primitive. And that's why I think blockchains like, or projects like Cosmos are very interesting and why we kind of like created Celestia to make deploying a Cosmos chain as easy as deploying a roll-up mm. or a smart contract. Because this idea where anyone should be able to create a chain because it's, it's an extremely powerful, powerful primitive that you can create a chain with no authority and you can have a contract among people. You can create rules in your chain and there's no... There's no authority whatsoever above that, except for the social contract among the people that use your chain. And that's where this idea of, you know, the the community computer in Cosmos comes in. Like you can create a community computer. Yeah, yeah. Let's, I I want to get into those, into the idea of community community computing in a bit. Maybe it'd be good if you want to now explain what is Celestia and what are uh, modular blockchains. Sure. So Celestia is kind of like the answer to the question of what is the most simple blockchain you could build? Like if you took up if you took a blockchain like Bitcoin and Ethereum and you strip it back to its core components, like what do you get? Like what is what fundamentally is a blockchain? Like what fundamentally are the core components of a blockchain? And that's why Celestia was originally called Lazy Ledger. Because it's like what's what's the laziest possible chain we can create? And it turns out, like, if you ship a, ship a blockchain back to its core components, um, like, imagine you can create a version of Bitcoin that does not verify anything. It's just, you can create a version of Bitcoin, for example, where developers can just dump arbitrary data onto it. Like, anything can go. That's the simple, simplest blockchain you can create. And the reason why that works is because even if you had a version of Bitcoin, for example, where invalid transactions were allowed on the chain, it's very easy to prevent. It's very easy to deal with that by simply having a client side rule that says simply ignore those invalid transactions. So it turns out you don't actually need mm. to. You don't need on-chain computation. You don't need to. Ver- you don't need to verify every transaction on the chain to have a simple blockchain that works. All you need is two th- components. The first component, which is referred to in the Bitcoin white paper, this idea of a timestamping server. server that timestamps messages and basically orders those messages. Like it tells you what came first. It, came, it tells you if this message came before that message. And that allows you to basically prevent double spending attacks. And the second component is this idea of data availability. Once you have ordering over those messages, you need to make sure that everyone knows what those messages actually are. And that and because they need, to, they need to know what messages what the messages are to even know what the state of the chain is. So if you have those two primitives, consensus and data availability, you can basically build anything on top. And the idea of Celestia was that we're, just, we're only going to provide those two primitives. Developers can use Celestia to build their own chains on top of it. Instead of using Celestia as a smart contract platform, you will developers will create their own chains on top of it in the form of rollups, like rollups, rollup chains basically. And and we also introduced this idea of sovereign chains, sovereign roll-up chains, which is kind of like very similar to Cosmos chains. That Cos- if you create a new ch- Cosmos chain, it's a sovereign chain. It's a chain in its own right. So you can also create a sovereign 
roll-up chain on Celestia that is like is, is very similar to its own L1 and has its own social consensus and does not kind of like derive, does not settle to some other L1 or derive its authority from the social consensus of a different L1. So if you, for example, we have Ethereum L2s, they kind of inherit the social consensus of, of the Ethereum L1, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, maybe to, if we could think about it, modular blockchains are basically deconstructing the separate components of what makes a full blockchain or what's often called a monolithic blockchain, a, a blockchain in its in its own right, I think you called it. It's so like Ethereum, yep. Bitcoin, all of these are monolithic blockchains in which everything is sort of within its own kind of stack or domain, if you can call it that. And yeah. modular blockchains is the idea that we can actually separate these different components that we've identified, including consensus and data avail availability. And then I think execution and another one I'm forgetting is like another component that's often identified. Yeah, consensus, data consensus yeah. execution, data availability, and settlement. Settlement, yes. That these things you can have kind of like separate components that you can almost like have it's almost like making a blockchain made out of several blockchains if we can call it like that where the the stack is separated a bit and there's specialization for each kind of modular part or each like part of the stack and you can create a full blockchain out of that is that kind of how a way to kind of understand it exactly so it's basically you're you're, you're decomping debundling the different components of a blockchain and it, the main idea is you decouple consensus from execution. So if you take Ethereum, for example, it has an enshrined smart contract environment, the Ethereum virtual machine. Well, with Celestia, there is no smart contracts. This is just a simple chain where you dump data onto it. Instead, the execution happens off-chain on other chains called rollups. So fundamentally, it's just basically separating consensus from computation. Yeah, the rotation happens on rollups instead of the L1, effectively. And so the, it, it um, is a way of that, also scaling. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, it's also a way of scaling because it's basically a kind of like more evolved form of sharding because mm -hmm. like you can treat, if you, you can treat different rollups as different shards. So you're basically like splitting, splitting up the chain and all the users into all these different rollups. And each rollup does not have to process the transactions of other rollups. Like each rollup only has to process the transaction of, of its own rollup. So that's it's a it's a good way of scaling, but fundamentally the reason why I think it's so important is because if you look at the previous crypto cycles, like there's always every single crypt every single crypto cycle, and bull run there's always these new layer ones chains, and each layer one claims to you know make an incremental improvement over the previous layer one. So you know for example we had Ethereum originally, and then we had chains like EOS, Cardano, and so on and so forth. Then in the last cycle, we had Solana and Avalanche. And in this cycle, we have chains like Sui and Aptos. And all of those kind of like make it, make they purport to make an incremental improvement over the previous generation. Like we say, okay, we maybe improve the execution environment to make it more faster. Maybe we, we improve the consensus protocol to make it faster. But I think that's very unsustainable to have to create a whole new layer one ecosystem every time you want to make a new incremental improvement to the technology. And that's why I think modularity is so important because if modularity existed a while ago in the blockchain space, then maybe when the Solana virtual machine improved the execution environment by making it more parallel, it wouldn't have to be a whole new layer one. It could just be a new rollup on Ethereum, for example. You can ch you can deploy a more improved execution environment using a rollup without having to deploy a whole new layer one ecosystem, which I think is fundamentally unsustainable and kind of like results in a lot of tribalism and maximalism. So the idea like this, every layer one ecosystem has its own maximalists and tribalists. But the idea of modular, modular blockchains is to kind of get past the maximalism. And it's kind of like the slogan is modularism, not maximalism. Because all mm -hmm. of these different people can, different, can build different components that, in, that work with each other instead of having to create their own ecosystems from scratch that are basically their own silos that don't really, that kind of like, you know, every time you deploy new layer one, you have to deploy the same domain applications, the same NFT applications, the same DeFi DEXs and so on and so forth. So it's basically like creating new cities with the same utilities in parallel, which I'm not sure is sustainable as the technology matures. Right. It's, it seems pretty 
unsustainable to me as well that like I don't know it's sort of like every time I hear there's a new layer one blockchain I'm sort of like do I want to go through the process again of trying to move all of my whatever like coins over to to their new blockchain and go through that process and try to see and the way that they I guess they kind of like try to try to get people to go is by like having weird incentives like uh, blast or whatever where they just you know say you can make a million APR APY or whatever so it's also you know it, it contributes to this to this problem of kind of scams I guess yeah. you can call yeah and modular blockchains are, are definitely not without their own problems like you also do have mm -hmm. kind of like a lot of roll-up chains that you have a lot of like EVM roll-up chains that want to scale the EVM and you know blast is a good example like yeah. that blast is also ethereum l2 right so it definitely has, also has its own problems but sure yeah it's similar to the cosmos ecosystem we might we might end up in an ecosystem where you know there's thousands of app chains right so like mm -hmm. right now everyone just uses ex expects to use the same l1 for all applications but as as the as technology evolves i don't think that's we will where, where we will necessarily end up because I just don't think it's realistic to assume that the entire Web3 will be running on the same chain. That's like assuming the entire internet will run on the same server. So right. I think like having a multi-chain or like app chain specific ecosystem is kind of like a natural consequence. And we, it's very possible that we can see a future where there's like thousands of app chains. Kind of like how the, the end goal or the end game of the Cosmos vision ultimately. Celestia kind of like makes it a, little, a lot more frictionless. Because now with Celestia, you can deploy your own roll-up chain as easily as deploying a smart contract. You can mm -hmm. go on a roll-up as a service provider <laughs> like a Conduit or Caldera, and you can deploy like a, your own roll-up chain in seconds, right? You just fill out a form. But you do that without having to deploy a whole new layer one, right? Because you're inheriting the security of Celestia. So it's not like you're building it from scratch. But I think it's obviously going to create a lot of UX challenges, which I think are solvable. Yeah. But I think that's where we'll end up. But I think it's a natural consequence because it's not like if you go on the web if you go on a web browser, you can go on thousands of websites, and I think it's going to be the same with wallets, right? Uh, with wallets, you can access thousands of chains. You, you, it's not really to assume that there's only one website or one um, chain that you're going to do all your activity through. Mm. Do you do you worry a little bit then that like it seems to me we we may be entering a time whenever like the creation of new chains is almost like the new ICO type of thing where everyone is making their own Absolutely. chain and I, I can see the the reasoning where people I think that I think app, app chains are, are interesting like proposal as a way to uh, reduce transaction costs for for using a particular chain and for having it specialized in certain ways it does and, it, and that does like potentially create a, a Cambrian explosion of all these different combinations of different parts together that could create chains that are specialized for different things. But maybe that, yeah. do you think that's something that's like potentially inevitable? Yeah, I mean, I see it as very similar to the evolution of Web2, right? You know, back in, back before the cloud existed, back before we had virtual machines on services like Amazon Web Services or Digital Ocean, and the only way to create a new website was you would either have to buy a whole server somewhere, like in, in a data center, like rent a mm -hmm. whole physical server, or you would have to just out, um, use a shared web hosting provider. Like GeoCities, for example, was a very early one, but you also had providers like Bluehost and Dreamhost. You would upload your code to this web hosting provider, like, and you would only support certain programming languages or technologies like PHP and MySQL. And that's very similar well, That's very similar to where we were with the blockchain space before rollups. Like you either had to create your own layer one from scratch with its own consensus mm -hmm. and with its own security budget, or you had to upload right. your smart contracts and create code it using the Ethereum virtual machine and upload it to Ethereum. But when the cloud came around in Web2, it gave people a third option. It gave people the best of both worlds, the best of having your own server, but with, that, with, with the flexibility of having your own server without the overhead of having your own server. Because, on, because now, because with the cloud, since you know, around 2005, you can deploy your own virtual machine in seconds, which basically gave you the same power as if you had your own physical server or data center because you could install whatever you want. So you had a lot more flexibility. And that basically what I think created the modern web because it allowed people to experiment with all sorts of new technologies. Like you were no longer limited to just PHP mm -hmm. and MySQL.
you could use you know Python, Ruby, Go, you know all those programming languages. I think fundamentally made the demand for them were driven by the fact that developers suddenly had a lot more flexibility in the way they they could deploy their applications. And mm. you know roll up chains are very similar, right? Because with roll ups you can deploy your own blockchain with own custom comp- execution environment very quickly without the overhead of having to create your own layer one chain from scratch. And we're kind of already seeing this play out. There's a lot of projects that, you know, have taken the Ethereum virtual machine and have modified it in some way that might would, have, would not have been easily possible possible without rollups. You know, there's projects like Curio, which have which like an on-chain gaming project that have modified the EVM to embed their game as an opcode inside the Ethereum virtual machine, which would not have been possible. And there's also projects like Manta, for example, that want to modify the Ethereum virtual machine and add certain like zero knowledge cryptography opcodes to allow certain privacy use cases, for example. Yeah, yeah. It allows for almost like more more it more iteration of different kind of like trying trying out new innovations within like chain space, I don't want to call it, with the EVM which then maybe mm-hmm. the Ethereum Foundation potentially likes because other chains can take that risk of, well, what if we wanted to add that to, you know, the Ethereum EVM or, EVM or something like that. But I think it also, yeah. if we get to this idea that you were talking about, about community computing, it, it's very similar to kind of the vision that Ethan Buckman shared with me, I think the first time that we had spoken about, and it is kind of like the general vision of Cosmos that I find uh, very interesting. But this idea that you can, rather than, you know, thinking of the computer and like this through the lens of this personal computing revolution, which was a very individualistic and, you know, uh, kind of sovereign individual type of uh, approach to thinking about uh, computers and the age of the internet, but instead imagining us as being part of a community that handles, that does computing together, which may sound like it, it is like a fairly to me it's like a fairly it's like sometimes hard to explain to people because people are so used to kind of dealing with big tech like when they go on the internet you know the first thing that they do is like go on facebook twitter or whatever else but like and and all of that computing or most of that computing is handled by you know a giant tech company but if we thinking if we're thinking about you know seizing, seizing the means of computation or something like that then it means that we need to create our own forms of community computation or like collective computation in order for that to, to, to happen. Yeah, I mean, and that's a big reason why we're making it as easy as, to, as possible to deploy a blockchain as in Celestia, with Celestia. Because you have this idea of sovereign chains and Celestia enables you to easily deploy a sovereign chain. Because to me, the most important part of a blockchain is not the layer one, but the layer zero, social consensus. To me, layer, the layer zero of a blockchain is the social consensus. Like what gives Bitcoin um, the authority? What gives Bit- like what give, what makes Bit- the Bitcoin chain the valid chain and not some fork? Is that people agree that it has value, right? So to me, it's like the, to me the whole point of blockchains is to implement rules that some group of people or well, the social consensus have agreed should be implemented, right? To me, like blockchains are just mm-hmm. a, in some way implementation detail of layer zero social consensus. So. When we see that, so the problem is like I see DAOs, and when you look at like how DAOs are governed, it's overly reliant on token holder governance, for example, which to me, in some mm-hmm. ways, defeats the whole point of blockchains and social consensus being the, important, the most important part. The idea where like DAOs, you know, it's just like you have to vote whoever it's a majority votes by token holders. To me, that's just like replicating, you know, traditional companies and putting them on chain. You have these share you have these shareholder votes. But with social consensus, mm-hmm. the idea is like it's a much more fluid form of governance. It's like there's no votes. It's more like it's more like a raw form of anarchy in a way, in the sense that you, you have to like you either agree or you don't. Like if you do, if you don't agree, then you don't have to join the fork. So it's like if you want to fork a chain, you basically need pretty much unanimous consent from the stakeholders. If there's like a, if there's a con- if there's a controversy, if someone's proposing a controversial upgrade or a change. It would be very hard to push through. And we've seen this with Bitcoin, for example. However, if you don't like it, you can just mm. fork, right? And you can fork in, into your... That's, that's the beauty of blockchains. You can fork into your own chain with jurisdiction and with its own social consensus. And the way that, the way that we've, we've approached governance at Celestia, for example, 
is we, we, even though we're a Cosmos chain, um, cause the, the, one of the issues I see with Cosmos chain is that they're overly reliant on token holder governance for things like upgrades. So like typically, if you want to upgrade the Cosmos chain, the token holders have to vote on what they're on upgrades on chain. And to me, that in some way that defeats the whole point of blockchains because the whole point of blockchains is that no on, no majority of people can violate the protocol rules. But then if you have like a bunch of token holders that can vote to say, hey, let's let's do this upgrade to let's say like print more money or violate the monetary policy of a, of a chain that was agreed on, or like seize these funds or do this controversial upgrade, uh, that to me that defeats the whole, that kind of defeats the whole point of chains being uncorruptible by some by some dishonest majority. Like blockchains are not are not meant to be democratic. They're supposed to be um, a, for, uh, a form of anarchism in the sense that you basically need unanimous consent, or like everyone is voluntarily agreeing to participate in the chain. But the way we've, we've approached that with Celestia is like we have a Ethereum style form of governance where upgrades are decided by the off-chain kind of ecosystem. We don't have, we don't have like on-chain governance, but the idea, but what we've done is before the chain was launched, we kind of like put towards like the, the, the social values of Celestia. So it's kind of like a constitution for Celestia. It's like here's, here's the values of Celestia. Like one of them, for example, is that we prioritize trust minimized light nodes. So like when we do feature upgrades, we should try to keep that in mind and not make any upgrades that violate that. Or we should, we want to achieve um, economic sustainability to economy of scale rather than scarcity. And so I think that's potentially a very powerful way to you basically have an initial constitution to say, okay, here's, here's the values of this chain. And then instead of having token holder governance, you basically say, you basically have like more like a fluid form of off-chain governance and the community can evaluate future upgrades among the kind of the constitution or the values of that chain. And that's why, like, for example, the Ethereum um, proof of stake upgrade was not controversial because it was always part of the original kind of Ethereum roadmap. Like, it wasn't a surprise to anyone. It's kind of like enshrined into Ethereum. And, but we want to enable, like, anyone to do that without having to deploy the layer one by creating their own sovereign blockchains in the form of rollups. So now you can, like, you, you can create your own sovereign chain in, in, in seconds using, you know, software like Rollkit, for example, which is like a rollup framework. And that kind of like gives the ability to create their own chain with its own social consensus that does not have to rely on token holder governance. Yeah, I think managing expectations is a, a very important skill to have, not even when making a blockchain, but also in many things in life. But yeah, I think it's part of the reason why the proof of stake kind of transition went off, went, went largely without a hitch because that was expected from the very beginning. Kind of the thing that also comes to my mind in this idea of community computing and what potentially Celestia and these types of solutions bring is that if you do want to start, say you're like, you want you to start, you know, the beginnings of like maybe a, a local blockchain that you have in your community or your organization that's still quite small, you can still kind of borrow from the security of other chains, for example, so that you don't have to also have this worry or risk, which is often the case in like, uh, very new chains that like someone will buy up, you know, use the free use the free market uh, as a way to buy up all of the the token power in your in your governance for your chain. Perhaps if you're using proof of stake or something like that, uh, but it also allows you to experiment with other types of governance measures while perhaps leveraging ones that are already proven so far. So it gives you some of that space so that you can perhaps have some amount of resilience with your with your small community chain as you try to make it grow. Maybe, I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about, since you mentioned token governance and venture capital, I think would be an interesting mm -hmm. topic to think about. Since venture capital does have quite a, a lot of influence in the crypto world and have been able to take advantage of this, I think, token governance to some, to some degree. Do you have any worries about the influence of venture capital, for example, in Celestia or in the crypto space in general? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an evolving um, thing, like how projects fundraise. And I think it's definitely a shame that projects have had to rely more and more on venture capital funding. And a big part, a big part of that is because of the regulatory environment. You know, back in 2017, mm. 
ICOs were the main way to fundraise. And ICOs obviously had their own problems. Like a lot of ICOs yeah. were scams and rug pulls, so they had their own problems. And then now it's much it's, it's much more harder to do ICOs in, in a regulatory or legally acceptable acceptable way, especially after the Telegram case where you know t- the Telegram token had a, had a lawsuit for doing their ICO or token sale. So now we see like the main way that projects distribute tokens to the community is through airdrops, mm-hmm. basically. And some in some ways that's both good and bad because at least we don't have you know these explicit you know scams or rug pulls. Yeah, you know, in some ways, like projects are basically forced to do that, to, to give the tokens away for free in order to have like bootstrap the initial community. Like back in 2017, ICO, they would have just, everything would have just been an ICO. But that being said, like to me, yeah, even though the kind of like the idea that blockchains have to raise from venture capital fund, funds is, a, is problematic, to me, one of the most important parts of a blockchain, as I mentioned, is this idea where, um, the blockchain should be trust minimized. So if you look at the threat model of blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, no honest majority. So even if like the validators or miners were dishonest, they cannot validate, they cannot um, violate the rules of the chain. So for example, if you take Ethereum, for example, let's say like someone owns most of the token supply, they can't just randomly insert invalid transactions into the chain. Instead, mm. what's supposed to happen is that full nodes are supposed to reject blocks with invalid transactions. So we, ideally, we should be constructing these blockchain systems so that they are not relying on things like, you know, plutoc- you know not relying on plutocratic systems where token holders can um, effectively choose what goes. And that's why I'm not really necessarily a big fan of systems like Tezos, where the idea, or even like the upgrade governance mechanisms in Cosmos and Portal, that where the idea is the token holders choose the upgrades. So I'm very kind of against those, as I mentioned, token holder governance. And the last year, we don't have token holder governance is very limited. And we only have token holder governance for a few key parameters, but upgrades are not governed by token holders. Because to me, we shouldn't mm. be creating plutocratic systems. And if we create kind of trust minimized systems with off chain governance, then I think we can limit the influence of venture capital funding because they won't have much that much influence over the governance mechanism. Like if we take Ethereum, if, mm. imagine if in Ethereum, right, the the governance mechanism, the governance the governance process of Ethereum is through these all all called dev calls and Ethereum improvement proposals, right? I mean, that has that has its own problems, but it's kind of the best we have so far. Like imagine if some massive Ethereum whale or investor started coming into these, yeah. Um, Ethereum improvement proposals and started proposing something that was controversial. Like no one would take it seriously, right? Just because they have a lot of tokens. Mm. So I think that's the kind of systems we should be kind of tr- trying to create. Yeah, yeah, I think there is. Yeah, I think the the question of government governance is sort of like, I think there is not really a perfect form of governance, but that we need to kind of find what are the types of structures that best fit the community that we want to create and like minimize the the kind of like the bad aspects of that system. And I do think like kind of the best thing that happened to Ethereum was that it didn't take this token governance approach, which which was good. I think what's actually interesting is something I've thought about. Standard venture capital is like the expectation that you're getting full equity of like a particular company enterprise project that you're investing in. But when you have venture capital that that where you purchase these tokens, you have maybe slightly more kind of say in how that power can be expressed with that token. So if it was just pure equity, then they have a lot more power, actually, a lot more ability to express their will versus just a token where uh, where you could take the token governance approach where the token is basically a form of equity um, or something like or like a stock. Or you can say that these tokens only like are able to express you're only used to express or vote on things within like a very specific domain so you can kind of perhaps put them make make them like a side theater rather than sort of like the main the main expression of power yeah I w- there's a very good talk by Celestia court engineer called Evan Forbes and he gave a talk on, on YouTube which I really recommend it's called like validators are cocks 
And yeah, he's like a, he's kind of like a big. He participates in a lot of validators. He runs a lot of validators for Cosmos chains. And his idea was like we should make validators cucks. Like the idea, like validators, they don't validators serve the users in a sense. Like they just provide a service. And he also said t- token holders, you know, governance, politicians, and so on and so forth are also cucks. So these parties should be serving the serving the end users. They're not like the, the end users don't serve them anyway. So, like as you said, the the token should be used to just kind of like serve a auxiliary governance function. It shouldn't be used as the main way to govern the protocol. For example, in Celestia, we use on chain governance and token holder governance to ma- to manage a few key protocol parameters, of like a few technical key protocol parameters. So it is more to serve the protocol and to kind of make the protocol function function on a technical level, than necessarily being used as a way to decide on the like high level direction or, or strategy of, of the protocol mm-hmm. yeah yeah and kind of the one of the last questions i wanted to ask actually is when can we see a lulsec chain well i don't think we'll be seeing that uh, well i mean lulsec <laughs> at least in its current form definitely does not exist anymore everyone yeah. has been arrested well most people have been i mean there are 16 members five of them have been arrested one of them is still out mm. there so who knows maybe he'll start the lulsec chain i don't think he's ever been caught but I haven't heard from him for a while. Yeah. Can, can you imagine like like with the... Because back back then, maybe the use was for Bitcoin. But I imagine with now with blockchains being able to use smart contracts and having all these expanded features and functions, do you find them as potential tools in kind of like hacktivist groups maybe in the future? If they aren't yeah, already? I mean, I think the killer use case... Yeah, I think the killer use case is still basically, you know, money. Because even back 2010, 2011, we, Anonymous and Voltec accepted donations uh, in Bitcoin. So in Voltec, mm-hmm. we had quite a lot of Bitcoin donations that we used to pay for things like, you know, servers mm-hmm. and, to, and other kind of tools. So I think that's still kind of the killer use case. But you could also imagine that, you know, blockchains and kind of like blockchain implementations of governance systems could be used to coordinate activists or hacktivists. And mm-hmm. like, you can imagine that, you know, you might want to, you know, like, so the same way that Cosmos chains have community pools, like community pools that where its members can vote on how funds should be spent. You could also imagine like activist groups that might find it difficult or to have access to, you know, like normal banking or, no, or would not be able to normally set up like a normal organization or association. They could set up like an organization on the chain and they have their own community pool. And they could, you know, govern how the community, the funds in the community pool could, could, can be spent for the activist causes, causes. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad we agree on that point. <laughs> cool. Well, maybe to end it off, Mustafa, thanks a lot for taking the time and sharing uh, your story and everything about Celestia. For the last thing, if you want to share with people where they can keep up with you, your work, and with how they can take part in maybe joining uh, Celestia as well. Yeah, you can go on the website celestia.org and you can find links to the Twitter and other social media there. And you can also learn how to run a data availability sampling light node there as well. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you.